because we'll get that out of the way first and then we'll dive in. Everyone can see my screen, is that correct? Or are they yes. not able to? Okay, yes. so you can see Zoom, YouTube. It says live on YouTube. Yep. Okay. All right, so we'll call the meeting to order, Tom. It is, let's see, 7.05. Okay, all right. Just a quick order, a uh, couple things before we get to our uh, Project Olive. Oh, uh, just, just one minute, Jeff. Hold on one second, because it takes a second to sync. Oh, okay. Yep. All right, Mike, we can, we can see the agenda, I think, on your computer. Are we good? There's always a minute where you hear two voices. Hopefully we're beyond that. So listen just for a second, then start. Okay. You don't hear me saying all these words? I hear you. Go ahead, Jeff. You're good. Okay, uh, we'll call the meeting to order 706 on June 25th. This is a virtual meeting of the Grand Island Conservation Advisory Board. Um, first up on our agenda tonight is the consent agenda from the minutes from last month. Does, uh, do any members have any corrections? No, looks good. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to accept the minutes. I move that we accept the minutes from- I move we accept the minutes. Okay, we'll have uh, Diane uh, moves to accept, Jim seconds. Um, all in favor? Uh, Jeff Aye. 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 Okay, so if we do a vote, uh, it, that seems unanimous. If we do a vote, we'll, um, we'll state our name and then I or nay, uh, if we have to vote on anything later in the meeting. But um, I want to welcome the new uh, Conservation Advisory Board member. We have two members coming aboard as alternates. We have a nine member board with two alternates. Um, and we have uh, Liz Zilbauer and uh, Jerry Sitarski. Uh, thank you guys so much for your interest. We're happy to have you. Um, uh, you're coming aboard as alternates and uh, alternates carry the same um, responsibilities as all the other board members. The only two differences are uh, you, can only vote in the absence of a regular member, which right now we're down three. So both of you are voting members of the Conservation Advisory Board tonight. Um, the second thing is, is um, a, full, uh, a full member gets appointed to a five-year term, um, whereas alternates, uh, they have to reapply every year. Um, so at the, in December, you still wanna do this, you just gotta let us know um, and I think those are the only two differences. Mike, uh, can you verify that? Yes, that is correct, sorry. I had to unmute. Okay, all right. So um, welcome aboard. Uh, I will share your contact information. We'll update our contact information. Uh, I've already gotten some things out to you. Um, this obviously is a lot different than our usual meetings, um, but um, you'll see when things get rolling, kind of what the board does and, and how we operate and the things we take a look at, but uh, welcome. Uh, hey, tonight. Hey, hey Jeff. Yes. Just, I'm under Donna tonight because my PC crashed trying to launch this. So just so you know who I am. Oh, okay. all right. Donna <laughs> is Carl. Stole her PC. <laughs> hey, Jeff, can they give a little background of each other, of the new members? Yeah. Themselves? Uh, if you don't mind introducing yourself, we can start with, uh, let's see, Liz. Sure, hello. Um, very uh, happy to have been appointed and I, I truly appreciate this opportunity. Um, I was, uh, I'm born and raised Islander. Um, I've lived here, but uh, in Grand Island for all but one year of my life. Um, I worked for the town actually as Peter McMahon's secretary 
about 11 years ago. Um, I worked there for a few years. I've spent the last 11 years teaching English, um, English as a new language in a Spanish English elementary school in Buffalo. Um, and I'm also about to be literacy certified. And um, I have many hobbies that are nature hobbies. I love gardening and have a horticulture certificate from botanical gardens. I'm getting into birding. Um, I have a little baby profile on Cornell's eBird. I like tree and wildflower identification, et cetera. So um, love my hometown. I'm glad to have the opportunity to serve in this capacity. Well, uh, thank you for your interest. Sounds good. Uh, Jerry, Hi, uh, I've been, you wanna introduce yourself? Yep. Um, I've been uh, an Islander for 35 years. Um, as an occupation, I, I was a product development engineer for 30 years. Um, I'm semi-retired right now and I have a little extra time on my hands, so I wanted to give back into the town in some way. Since I've been involved with wildlife and nature most of my life, I felt that the CAB was a great way to help out. So I'm really excited to be here and I thank you guys for the opportunity. Thanks for joining us, Jerry. And just uh, a quick interjection here, Jeff. Um, if everyone could go on mute, sometimes there's real bad feedback. And if everyone goes on mute, just when you have to talk, um, unmute yourself. I hear the click. Andy, is it, do you hear that clicking? There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, welcome. We'll, we'll get to introducing ourselves too. Um, uh, you know, the kind of in a, a more uh, personal setting um, and not everybody is here. Um, uh, we are happy to have, uh, you know, fellow environmentally uh, minded people uh, on our board. Uh, tonight's meeting is, uh, a bulk of the meeting is going to be on uh, Project Olive. Uh, I see we got various members from Project Olive uh, that are here. Um, and uh, I think we, uh, in, in, in an effort to get this uh, moving along, uh, we will kind of hand the meeting over to them. Um, I know that they have some stuff that they wanted to uh, show us and then uh, we will open it up for questions and comments um, afterwards. So um, Mike, if you want to go ahead and, and let them let the developers from TC Buffalo present, if you just want to state your name um, and your role in the development, that would be helpful to us and our new members. Great. Um, I'll get started. I am Kim Nason. I'm a partner with Philip Lido representing the applicant TC Buffalo. Um, James Murray Coleman and Andy Ernesto are with us as well. They are with TC Buffalo, so they can answer any questions you may have tonight. We also importantly have Bob Martz and Mike Finan from Ring and Engineers, um, who, I, who I absolutely can answer a lot of your questions as well. I know um, Bob himself uh, did a lot of the field survey work that I'll talk about. So, um, happy to answer any questions you may have. We are very glad to be before this board finally, and we thank everybody for jumping in, uh, into this virtual meeting. I know we've spoken with some members of this board. We met early on uh, in March with representatives from some advisory boards and also with long range planning, but we're happy to be before the full board and have a dialogue tonight. Um, I think it probably makes most sense for us to focus our, our, our initial presentation this evening on the materials that are most relevant to this board's review and this board's purview. Um, obviously there's been a lot of stuff submitted, so I just want to start uh, by saying, you know, providing a brief summary of what's out there, what's been submitted um, with respect to materials relevant to this board. So, Back in February, we filed our application for the PDD for the storage and distribution facility. And as part of that application, there was a detailed analysis of environmental impacts pursuant to Seeker. That was a large document that included an analysis of potential impacts of all media, um, but also included several. Mike, are you talking? I think you're on mute. Yes, actually, I was. Uh, James Murray told me. Could you just go on mute? I, I think some of that feedback we're hearing is coming from your 
Jason. I'm actually on mute on my phone, so uh, I'm not, I can't, uh, you're not seeing my mute, but I am on mute. Okay. Okay. Um, and so there are also several expert reports attached to that as well. So you can hear, um, you, you'll, you'll hear me reference those and those have been updated and submitted as well. So it all goes back to that original analysis of environmental impacts, but there've been a lot of work in there since then. Before we get into everything and it's out there and some of have been submitted, I do just wanna clarify one point. I know we've heard this uh, in the past as a comment and we just wanna sort of set the record straight. Um, in terms of what studies have been done and what's out there. And we've heard that, you know, nothing has been updated and the, the information that this is based on is from 30 years ago, 1990. So I just want to clarify that. Um, we absolutely did review the documentation, the extensive documentation that was prepared uh, with respect to the site back in the 90s. However, there has been updated studies done to date um, last year and early this year. Um, so the information that I'm talking about is not from 1990. It is updated, it has been updated and that information was included in our original supplement. Um, and with those additional studies, we have found that not much has changed from the extensive studies that have, were done in the 90s. So we did point that out, but recent studies have been done for the site. So I think we can start um, with the materials on wetlands and waters maybe that were submitted with that original impact. So there was a wetlands and waters assessment and a wetland delineation from 2019 included in those original application materials. Uh, we are anticipating approximately 0.79 acres of wetland disturbance and those are federal wetlands. There is no disturbance of New York state regulated wetlands or buffer areas proposed in connection with the project. Um, we have a jurisdictional determination from the Army Corps and are moving through the wetland permitting process with the Army Corps and DEC and Langing can answer some additional questions on that process. Uh, we anticipate that uh, we will be obviously complying with all permitting requirements of those agencies, but we'll also be purchasing wetland mitigation credits uh, in connection with that development. And there will also be uh, significant improvements to stormwater capacity on site as well. We are also proposing the relocation of the feeder creek to the western portion of the site, which we can answer some questions on as well, but there's information in the filings on that. As part of the wetland delineation that was performed for the site, there is a detailed vegetation survey included uh, in that original documentation. Uh, generally, that reveals that the majority of the site and particularly the area in which we're proposing development um, consists of vegetation and herbaceous cover that is not of uh, significant aesthetic or ecological importance. Uh, there are scattered trees obviously present across the site. However, um, or across the Southern portion of the site, I should say, but mature stands of tree are generally limited to areas of the site where we are not proposing development. But there is, as I mentioned, detailed vegetation survey included in the wetland delineation, which is from 2019, not from 30 years ago. Um, there also is a threatened and endangered species assessment included in that original February analysis of environmental impacts. Generally, I'll touch on um, the main points in that. Um, we've interacted with fish and wildlife at the federal level and the DEC natural heritage program at the state level. Uh, the natural heritage program has said there is no documented occurrences of rare state listed plants, animals, or significant natural communities on site. However, uh, certain endangered or threatened species were identified as potentially present by the NHP. Um, the documentation that we've provided and the field surveys that Langen completed um, on three separate occasions have revealed that it is unlikely that these uh, species are present on site due to the lack of sufficient or ideal habitat. Um, specifically, NHP no noted the black-nosed shiner, the short-eared owl, and the silver maple swamp. Um, just to start with the silver maple ash swamp, that is actually located in Buckhorn State Park um, and not on our site. 
With respect to the black nose shiner, uh, that's not threatened or endangered, but it is rare. Sorry, my dogs are working. <laughs> um, it was identified previously in the Niagara River. Uh, while the feeder creek on site does discharge um, to the Niagara River, the feeder creek itself does not provide consistent water levels or habitat to support the black nose shiner population. And then finally, the short eared owl. So that was last observed in the area in 1979. Um, due to the limited size of open vegetated areas on our site, um, coupled with the nearby residential and commercial development and some of the disturbance associated with the sanitary sewer construction, um, the reports we've submitted identify that the site does not have a significant amount of suitable habitat for the short-eared owl. And actually in follow-up to that, when Langen was meeting with DEC in connection with wetlands permitting earlier this year, I believe in February, um, DEC at that meeting did support the finding that um, there is an absence of suitable habitat for short year owl at the site. So that's where uh, the NHP review stands at this point. Fish and Wildlife did indicate that the Northern Long-Eared Bat should be considered in our evaluation of the project. Um, however, NHP indicated that, you know, there are no known occurrences in proximity to the site and no critical habitats for the northern long-eared bat were identified on the site as well. So we will continue to engage with NHP and with Fish and Wildlife in connection with the wetlands permitting project or process, I should say. Um, but to, to date, from the field work that Langen has completed, um, it is not anticipated that there would be any impacts to any significant natural communities, threatened and endangered species, rare species. Um, so that's, that was the original file. After that, in April, we received written comments from this board. Um, and as part of our May submittal, which included responses to town board, planning board, long range planning, updated traffic supplement, we did also respond to the comments from this board. Um, many of our responses were referencing back to materials that were originally submitted, just helping to point out where some of this information that I mentioned uh, was located. Um, we also had in that documentation, the Army Corps jurisdictional de determination, and we had our letter of no effect from SHPO, um, and I mentioned the updated traffic information. And then most recently, you may have heard us mention the fourth supplement. So that was submitted earlier this month. Um, among other things, that document uh, responds to all of the comments we have received from the town's consultants that it had hired. Um, so it includes detailed responses to any comments received from town consultants. And then the expert reports were updated in connection with those comments received. So if you look at that fourth supplement, um, which was submitted in June and is available on the town's website that has the most recent copies of any reports. Again, agency interactions are, are continuing as well. We, we're, we're working with the town, we're working with the town's consultants and have submitted a detailed record, but we also circulate that record to, I think, at least 24 interested and involved agencies. And as I mentioned, we'll continue interaction with Fish and Wildlife and the Natural Heritage Program. Army Corps and DEC in connection with the wetlands permitting process. So those agency communications will be ongoing. Uh, we also interact with many other agencies, especially, you know, Erie County DPW, DOT, uh, Thruway Authority in connection with evaluation of traffic impacts as well. One final thing, project updates that are relevant to this board uh, as well. We have proposed adding a bike and pedestrian path to the eastern portion of the site. Uh, we have also proposed moving the access drive on Long to the east a bit away from the neighboring property to further mitigate any potential noise impacts. And then finally, um, James has engaged in discussions with the NFTA and we anticipate that there will be an NFTA stop on site in front of the building. So that's a recent development as well. So again, there's been extensive review. There's a lot of documentation out there. I know it's a lot to go through, but we're looking forward to having you know, this dialogue this evening so we can answer any questions on those materials. As I mentioned, 
There have been no significant natural communities or critical environmental areas or habitats identified here. Um, the project will not fragment significant habitats and we, there's been no critical vegetation identified, which is known for creating important breeding sites. So anyway, this is not a particularly sensitive ecological area from the studies that have been done. Obviously there are some areas around like Buckhorn State Park that are, um, but this property is not. And as you know, it's zoned industrial and has been targeted for development for decades. Um, and actually, you know, this footprint is potentially smaller than some of the other concepts that were previously identified for development here in through the town's comprehensive plan process. So we really think this, this is an ideal location for the site. But again, we're looking forward to having a discussion with this board. Um, I think now I will turn it over to Bob and Mike, um, as I know you want to hear from them this evening. Um, Bob, do you just want to give a, a, a summary of the work that you've done in connection with the site? Excuse me, this is Jim. Do you want to have questions now or later? Um, if if it's okay with you, I think I'd like Bob to just introduce himself kind of and then and then any questions, if that works okay. for, for you, Mike, and everybody else, Jeff. And, and just to confirm, I think you were going to show share your screen and show some maps and other drawings. Is that correct? Or were you still um, planning on doing that? I believe yeah. it's necessary. Mike Finan um, will share some of those. Yeah, if you like, I can share the site plan just so we have a background to look at. I just wanted to announce it before I just put it up on the screen. Just yeah, one other thing. No uh, was there a walkthrough with the CAP board of the site and what's proposed? A walkthrough with board members? No. We had we asked for it, like but then COVID hit. So I think we could ask to do that now. Um, originally, um, TC Buffalo had said they would prefer we did not go on the property. So is that, is that an official request then, Mike? Um, yeah, let's, let's let them present and let's make okay. sure we uh, get a commitment for that uh, going forward at the end of, or after their presentation. Can I ask one more question? Last Hopefully, one. Jeff. Uh, Jeff, did you submit the comment that we recently put together? Submit comments that we recently put together? The, the, the document for an environmental consultant is that is that what you're referring to jim well i it's the list that you got comment from everybody on the board oh the questions yeah those, those questions uh no we're just kind of looking at the questions we, we just okay. kind of prepared some questions for and the, we're gonna submit something then uh possibly well let's let them present and then um uh after we've seen what they have we'll uh we'll ask them some of the questions yeah, it sounds like that's that was for this meeting for this this discussion. Yeah. It sounds like mm -hmm. not being aware of exactly what you're talking about. Right. Okay. Uh, so uh, is this Robert that's presenting? Yeah. Hi. I'll I'll just give you a little background of myself. I am a professional wetland scientist. I have a bachelor's degree in environmental science with a minor in wildlife management. I've been practicing natural resources evaluations and permitting for 16 years plus now, um, all with Lang and Engineering, and I'm quite familiar with projects like this and these portions of the state. Um, I think, Kim, you covered it pretty well in terms of what's been done. I, I will only add that as part of the relocation of the stream, Langen did conduct a somewhat of a detailed characterization of the physical and ecological components of the existing stream, just to help support our position and, and the, the design that's proposed in terms of the relocation. Um, so that data is available. That was all submitted to the Army Corps of Engineers as part of the wetland permit application. Um, and you know, I'm not I'm not sure what what more to, to say as it as it relates to the threatened and endangered species and wildlife and ecology, but as Kim said, happy to answer any questions or uh, requests for information or otherwise that you guys have. Great, 
Thanks, Bob. Um, Mike, did you want to add anything or do you want to go right into question and answer? No, I think I think we can go right into questions and answers. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, um, many of our, our board, we, we definitely look ex looked extensively at this. Um, a couple of things to start off. Kim, you mentioned, um, you know, uh, the town's environmental consultant. Um, I, I just want to ask, I, I see um, uh, Mike Madigan there. Did the town hire an environmental consultant and do we have results from one that? We, we have? have not yet hired one. Um, I believe that's in process as we're speaking, or it will be. Um, I'm going to confirm that tomorrow morning again. Okay. Uh, we have another meeting tomorrow at 1130. Not on this topic, but that that will be confirmed. Okay. All right. Um, uh, does anybody uh, want to start off, or do you want me to ask the first question? I know we got lots of questions here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Suzanne had a question about air quality. Um, Mike, Diane is disconnected. So if she pops in, uh, let her back in. Um, has a baseline study been uh, done of the site's current air quality and how does the developer plan to mitigate the impact of diesel fumes um, emanating from all these uh, trucks that are you know, gonna be going slow and idling? Sorry, just unmuting myself. Um, there was not a baseline study completed uh, with respect to that. The, you know, we submitted some information um, in response to that initial question about air pollution from the CAB. Um, we noted that ambient air quality standards in Region 9 are, are in attainment currently. Uh, this facility is not required to have any air regulations or air permits for its functioning. Um, with respect to vehicles specifically, uh, based on the project's operation, uh, the vehicles are not anticipated to be idling excessively. They already have to comply with uh, DEC regulations with respect to heavy duty vehicle idling. Um, again, I, I think that James and, and Lange can speak to this, but the way the project operations are defined, there are full-time yard jockeys that move trailers around. So the idea is um, that there are not trucks there idling at the site. They come in, drop their trailer off, get a new trailer and leave. But again, Langan um, and James can speak to that in a bit more, more detail. Um, so generally that is meant to eliminate sound impacts, air impacts from any idling trucks that are located at the site. Uh, additionally, there's been extensive documentation with respect to traffic. Uh, the most recent traffic impact and study is included in that fourth supplement I mentioned. And the traffic that is anticipated to be associated by this project is not of a quantity that is expected to significantly impact any addition of, of vehicular pollutants. So I don't know if James or, or Mike, you want to add anything to that at this point. Um, but just generally speaking, we are not anticipating uh, any significant increases in vehicular pollution from the project. Yeah, I'll just add that the uh, the project itself and, and the traffic to and from the project are, <clears throat> as Kim said, a small percentage of the total amount of traffic, say, for instance, that's on the I-190 right next door. So um, it, 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 whatever, people are, 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 you know, think will be sort of affected by um, these trucks that are coming and dropping off their trailers. They, they will not sit there and, and stay warm in their trailer and that sort of thing. There is a trucker's lounge in the building. They will drop their trailer. They'll either, they'll either the trailer will stay attached to the truck or the tractor, or it will go and park se separately and pick up another trailer, as Kim said. But um, this is not a truck stop. This is not a kind of facility where trucks will come and sit idling, staying warm while they're waiting to, to move their next load. They, they will literally drop their trailer and wait and um, or move on with a different trailer. So it's uh, we, we don't anticipate any adverse uh, air quality effects from the project at all. Just a, a comment, you know, I work with different contractors, transportation, but you, you might want to issue something to the drivers 
to tell them what the rules are like that. I know a six minute rule, no idling unless you're connected and actively moving and that they have a lounge that they can go in because a lot of these truckers, they, they know the regulations, but they don't really keep to them. Jim, that, that's a, that's a definitely. James, you're muted. And while, just while there's a pause, I know someone just rejoined. Is that Diane that joined by phone? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yes, I'm on the phone. I can't see anything, but I can hear you. Okay, just double checking. Go ahead. Sorry to okay. interrupt. Okay, thank sorry. you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, Jim. I, I was trying to use the space bar as my unmuting mechanism. It doesn't seem to work here. So, um, yeah, all I was saying is that's a good idea, idea Jim. We can definitely uh, take that under advisement and um, and put that in the notes here. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, it, it's always a good idea. Um, you know, it, it's, it's tough to prove a change without a baseline study. The initial baseline study uh, is important just to monitor change. If no baseline study is done, nobody will ever know how much of an impact that, um, you know, uh, as far as air quality, um, you know, these vehicles are having, especially in, in the, it's such a unique situation where we have low density residential bumping right up against um, a project of this size. And, um, you know, uh, our concern is with those families um, just because, you know, they're carcinogenic fumes and, and we were looking out for our community. So a baseline study would help um, if problems were to arise in the future. Um, let's see, uh, Suzanne, did you have a question? Can't see anybody. Jeff, are we going down through the questions? Is that yeah. what we're doing? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. So I did read some of the comments that residents, particularly, you know, residents who live in um, adjacent to this project. And so my question is, currently there's a natural barrier of 99.61 acres of forest, and that's going to be reduced to 15.02 acres. Now, those that acreage, those forests, you know, would serve as a barrier to any increase in, in noise and light levels. How are the impacts of noise and light levels going to be mitigated for the people, particularly on Bedell Road, who, are, who will definitely be impacted by this? How will they be protected? So um, to speak to noise specifically, a detailed noise study uh, was submitted to the town and indicates that um, the project will be in compliance with all local and state requirements. Uh, we did receive detailed comments from the town's consultants and we responded to those as well and an updated noise analysis is included in there. Um, with respect to light as well, um, we did receive detailed comments from the town's consultants on lighting and have included some responses to those as well. And I do believe there may be some changes to lighting proposed along the Dell as well, but Mike Finan um, could speak to those in a bit more detail. Uh, yeah, Kim, that's correct. So there, there was some light spillage along our uh, entry driveway along uh, coming off of Bedell, um, but through comments that we've received from the town's consultants, we now have zero light spillage over the lot line uh, by using, you know, fully shielded cutoff lights, uh, LED. So we, we have complied with the, with the comments provided by the town's consultants. Can I follow up with, a, with another comment? So when, you know, when Fuchillo moved into our Boulevard that, you know, their lights are on 24 um, seven. Is the lighting going to be similar to that? The whole road on our Boulevard is now a series of, of car lots and those lights are on 24 seven. So my question is, is that, is that similar to the light exposure that will be experienced by the residents of the Dell Road. Because I can't imagine that there won't be any spillage if that's the case. 
unfortunately, I can't answer that because I'm not familiar with the facility you're talking about, but um, this is a 24 hour operation. So the lights will likely be on. Uh, but like we said, we've run a photometric study of the specific light fixture that we're proposing. And there is, and there's documentation and plans that we've provided that show that there will be zero light spillage across the lot lines, which complies with the town's requirements and regulations. Thank you. And this is, this is Diane. I believe you are going to use the dark sky lighting. That's correct. That's correct. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, that's, that's good. Thank you. So the dark sky, it'll meet the dark sky standards is what you're saying? That's correct. Yes. That's good. Thank you. So Jeff, do you want us to go down through our questions in the order that we submitted them? Yes, we can do that. Uh, uh, okay. Tom, did uh, Tom Burke have a question? Yes, he did. Go ahead, Tom. You know, my question concerned fragmentation of adjacent habitats. I think Kim said that fragmentation was determined not to be an issue, but my question would be, does this project isolate Buckhorn State Park from the remainder of Grand Island in any way, shape, or form? Can we allow for corridors through the property for movement of wildlife in and out of Buckhorn? Bob or Mike, can you speak to, to that point? I will, I will try to answer that. I think Buckhorn State Park is about a half a mile as the crow flies from this property. And I don't think there's a continuous corridor of habitat between our site and there. Actually, I think an appendage of Buckhorn comes pretty close to Long Road there, you know, uh, certainly not a half a mile from your property. And I think that the wildlife is traditionally use that stream corridor that comes under Long Road as one access out. Okay, well, I, I guess I would add that, you know, where the stream is being relocated is to the west contiguous to what's not being touched and what came, you know, contains that mosaic of wetlands and mature woodlands to remain. So you'll still have somewhat of a corridor there that, you know, is present today and will remain afterward. Well, I, I did realize that, uh, Bob, and what I'm just trying to do is make sure that people are aware of its importance and perhaps uh, the developer could acknowledge that, you know, that into perpetuity, that'll be, that portion will be preserved and managed in such a way as to enhance wildlife movement. Catch my drift? Uh, you know, I won't, I wouldn't commit to it, but all, in all likelihood, by way of the wetland permitting, um, the Army Corps of Engineers is likely going to require a deed restriction on created wetlands and relocated stream. So I don't think there's going to be any concern of that being eliminated in the future. Yeah, I, I, I would add to that, Bob, um, that this area in here that you can see is all DEC wetland and encumbered by 100 foot adjacent area that requires permitting to impact. So effectively this area has been avoided by us and is protected. So the likelihood of this area being developed is very low. Just while you're discussing that stream, show, could you show us how it's, where it's going to be in the new court or the new, sure. and what it looked like before that? So, so right now, and I'll change the color in a minute, this yellow line, if you could see that, So, so red line, that, that's the existing feeder creek roughly as it exists today. And we're relocating it here. And again, I'll change the color just so you could see it. So we're, we're moving it westerly. So from this location to this location. We should, we should add, Mike, that 
the relocated alignment of the stream is consistent, if not about 100 linear feet longer than what's on site today. That's correct. Um, so both in terms of length and width proposed, it's quite similar. Is, is the new locate? Is this still going to be uh, surface, or is it going to be underground? It's an open. It's an open channel. Okay. Similar to what it is. To, very similar to what it is today. And I'd like to ask if you'll be putting any um, buffers, like vegetation, along along that creek when you reroute it. Yes, we have a full landscaping plan uh, that does show landscaping in and around this area, and I'm sure there's that's still subject to Bob. You correct me if I'm wrong. Army Corps review and and consideration. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Will, will that be a mowed area there, or will it actually be allowed to be um, grow out like it currently is? I don't think there's any plans to mow it. Okay. And that holding pond, so it'll run right next to this holding pond. Is that correct? Uh, yes. So right now, as we've been informed by Bob Westfall, and the town engineer, is there some upstream flooding that occurs here, which is predominantly resulting from the grade of the of the existing feeder creek, which is relatively flat. And then obviously that discharges into existing drainage pipes along Long Road. So when those pipes hit their capacity, this creek effectively backs up and causes flooding on the south end of uh, of its where, wherever it begins uh, up here along the Dell. So what we're doing is we're taking that water into the new Peter Creek location and during peak events, we will shave off that excess floodwaters into this large detention basin uh, to store it here rather than offsite upstream. And then we were slow, slowly meter that back out into the discharge at the capacity of the existing pipes along Long Road. So we are also solving an upstream flooding problem that currently exists. And just real quick, Mike, from, from an ecological perspective that, as he said, during peak flows, you know, it would, it would run off into the pond, but under normal conditions, you'd still maintain that downstream flow for whatever ecological importance, you know, remains or is present downstream. And would that retention pond typically be full of water or what would you expect based on your analysis? Yes, it will be full of water uh, and we will be using, you know, effectively, I'd have to look up exactly how much of the top of that basin we're using, but it's, it's a few feet of the top of that basin for stormwater retention and control. But yes, it will be a quote unquote a lake. The creek is going next to the wetlands, right? So is there going to be an impact to the wetlands based on the creek routing? No. The, these wetlands here, which are DEC wetlands, are in, in elevation much higher than the elevation of the creek. Yeah. Mike, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm trying to connect again with my computer. If, if you happen to see that, could you help let me in? <laughs> Just because I can't, I can't see anything visually. So, I'm looking for you. I did admit you about three minutes ago. So. Um, oh, you did. Yeah. You might need to try okay. again because I'm not seeing you on the list and there's only 16. So try again because I did hit admit okay. probably three minutes ago. Okay. Because you pop up is on my a, screen. Is there a way on my phone that I can see what's going on? Or Try it again. I, 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 I'm going to guess okay. we'll get you in this time. So let's try it again. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I'll try again. All right. Uh, so we're we're definitely uh, you know on on the topic of stream location. Is there any CAB members have any questions? More questions about the the stream location? No. The, the only thing I have about the stream is right. I mean, obviously we haven't seen 
you know, the depth or anything in it, but is, is there any spawning of, of, you know, minnows or, or anything in that Creek or I'm sure there's probably some kind of ducks or something that spawns. So when you relocate, is there a possibility we relocated not during, you know, during construction during the breeding season? Yeah, so, ba so based on the characteris characterization that we did in March of this year, the stream is definitely an intermittent stream, meaning it doesn't flow year round. So it's unlikely that it supports any type of fisheries or any population of fisheries at that. And the majority of the creek contains a, a thick layer of silt and is densely vegetated with cattails and purple loosestrife and other type of invasive species. Um, so I don't think you would see any type of waterfowl or again, fisheries resources. Certainly it could be utilized by you know, turtles and you know some herpeto fauna, but um, I wouldn't expect that relocation of the stream would um, adversely impact its use. I mean, what we're doing is you know relocating the stream, but also creating an additional two and a half acres of floodplain wetlands, and again preserving those mature stands of wooded wetlands along the west that would certainly be reused by any species that might be using the creek today. If the uh, stream is intermittent, um, how will you maintain water level in the pond? So the, the pond also takes on, uh, there is a groundwater source down as deep as we're digging this. Uh, some of our borings have found uh, groundwater present. We are also taking in water from our entire development. So, so once this pond is full, other than it could have some level of evaporation, but it'll, it'll continuously fill itself, obviously through the creek itself and then through all of the impervious area that is occurring on the site. So everything ultimately funnels into this, this pond up here from all of the other stormwater features we have on site. So we, we believe that it will continuously thrive and drive itself. There's also water in these wetlands that we believe will bleed off and trickle down into the pond. Do you think that the pond will need um, dredging at times or cattail removal? I would think not, given that there'll be a standing water source. Uh, Bob, maybe you can answer that more specifically. Yeah, I think just because of the depth of the pond, it's unlikely to, to need any type of, you know, normal maintenance dredging. Uh, it's hard to say if it might be required or not, but I, I suspect based on the sources and management of stormwater, it's probably not the case. How is the, how is the uh, discharge from the pond controlled? Is it by a gate or by where or what? It, it's controlled by uh, an outlet control structure, which has uh, weirs within it or orifices within it. So, it, you know, it's 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 controlled by as, as the water rises in that pond, it'll hit certain weirs or orifices and discharge at the rate that those orifices are sized for. Okay. Uh, and, and going back to just, you know, the relocation of the creek, I, I think it's important to note that, that this portion of the creek will likely have to be built first. And we could build it majority independent of impacting the existing. So, so this piece could be fully constructed and then we would tie into the two ends and allow any waters to bypass our construction site so that we can work in dry conditions. So, so I think there is you know, a strategic way to relocate this and, and keep this in, in play for a little while until, until we need to get into that area. Where do the footer drains uh, drain on the building? Not the downspouts, but the footer drains. Do you, I assume you got footer drains under that building and about buying foundations. Uh, I, I believe most of our drainage is, is from rooftop. This is a slab on grade. There is fill going into the site. So we don't expect to see groundwater at the footings. Okay, um, which, which way does groundwater flow now? Does that in building in, impede groundwater flow? Does it go, what, what's the direction of groundwater flow? Um, I, 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 I can answer that question more specifically um, 
probably, I, I don't want to, I can't answer that now. So our geotechnical evaluation is still underway. Um, I have been told that there's heavy clay on the site. So groundwater movement is extremely slow and somewhat difficult to determine where it's going. Um, but I would, I would I venture to guess that it all comes down towards the feeder creek and out um, from, from, the, from the west towards the east. This side of the property is relatively flat, so I couldn't specifically state whether it goes down towards the, the collector creek down here or there's a split in the groundwater, whether some comes this way or some goes towards the central uh, feeder creek. I couldn't tell you exactly. Will a bulk of the runoff from the concrete um, feed the, um, the larger pond that you have in the upper right corner there? Yeah, yep. So, so a, lar a large part of the building and truck court, um, this portion of the truck court goes to this pond here, majority of the building and this portion of truck court and driveway come here and portions of the parking area come to these as well as the roads and any other surfaces that are you know mixed in with the parking area now with our with our climate obviously having the cold winters um i'm assuming that you'll be salting um the areas where there will be parking or and trucks coming in and out Do you have ways to monitor the salinization of those ponds so that the salt doesn't spill out off the property? Uh, James, I don't know if you know if the end user has any any mechanisms in place for that. I'm unfamiliar. What I can tell you is that, you know, there are bioretention systems which are filtering practices that are precursors to all of the ponds on the site. So nothing discharges directly to the ponds themselves. They go to bioretention areas, which are, if you're not familiar, uh, they're engineered media locations that have a special soil matrix to them, composition that allow for nitrogens, phosphorus, and other TSS to settle out on the surface to be uptaked by specific plants and then the clean water uh, will be collected by a, an underdrain system, which then discharges into the ponds, which meets the DEC and um, local criteria for stormwater management. So I, I would think that anything would get caught in those bioretentions prior to entering into the stormwater basins themselves. And if, and if there was salting that, say, was pushed over there by snow or something like that, that it would be of such a low volume or quantity that it shouldn't have an impact. Okay. Um, I think, uh, Jerry, did you have a question about, um, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen with the wildlife in the area? Yeah. Yep. Um, when, when construction starts, there, there will be a, a, a wildlife flight to safety, you know, 62 acres. And speaking from experience, experience when Heron Point was built, all of the neighbors on Webb Road here, and I believe on Stony Point, we're just inundated with uh, possums, raccoons, skunks for probably the first months. Many of these ended up under porches, decks, and uh, sheds. And a lot of neighbors just didn't know what to do at that point. I guess what I'm doing here is maybe just recommending that maybe a program be established such that uh, homeowners could call and have have these animals safely um, removed and uh, relocated at no cost to the homeowners. Just wanted to get your thought on that. Yeah, we can take that into consideration and, and give that a look. Um, again, just to, to remind everybody here, to the extent that we can't answer any questions tonight, um, we'll, we'll be happy to follow up in writing. And anytime you have thoughts or suggestions like that, we can give them thought and uh, respond in writing if we can't address them tonight. But yeah, we can certainly take uh, that into account. Thank you. Okay, Liz, did you have a few questions? Did you say Liz? <laughs> Liz, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, 
The first question I had listed had to do with the lighting poles um, and the consideration of the the removal of um, trees within development. So first, I just want to um, have clarified the the acreage of the trees that are going to be removed, um, and then um, so well, if that that could be answered first, actually. It's eight o'clock. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to just ask a real quick question, James. You're you're still on the phone, is or you're on the call, right, James Murray Coleman? Just want to make sure that we didn't lose you there. You might be muted. <clears throat> you seem to be muted, but it looks like James is on. I know. Uh, at least one person asked about that. So it seems like he's on the call. I'll shoot him a text message to make sure he's still on. He appears active, so other than he's muted. So I'll, I, I just shot him a text message now. Um, just in response to your question, Mike or Bob, do you know the number offhand of acreage of tree removal? I can double check. I'm uh, unfortunately I don't. I'm trying to look it up now, and I'm not certain if we've quantified it in terms of tree removal versus just area of disturbance, which would include everything. I'm, I'm pulling up the EAF now just to see. I think what we had acknowledged on the joint permit application to the Army Corps was 84 acres. But that Again, that includes all of the uh, shrub land and not necessarily treed areas. Right. Okay. Um, all right, so then it, it would be of interest for me to have a better idea of just exactly how much mature forest is being removed. Um, I know that Kimberly had addressed that in her presentation, um, but maybe if it could be repeated. And um, so my question has to do with if, you know, considering the removal of mature forest and the return of Osprey to the Great Lakes region, um, I feel like there's a consideration that needs to be um, on the table regarding Osprey nesting platforms, um, which could be placed atop the proposed light poles. Um, this is something that other communities that are experiencing a resurgence in uh, Osprey are having to do, but after the fact, after there've already been electrical disturbances and fires that occur, um, when the Osprey choose these um, electrical poles or lighting uh, standards in order to, to nest. So I was just wondering if, um, if there's any consideration of that to be proactive um, about that factor. Again, that's a helpful comment um, and something we can certainly look into. Thank you. Just to follow up on her comment and on Liz's comment, is that for trees, mature trees that you're going to remove in that, is there any plans to plant trees other words on site or even off site? Yeah, there is a substantial landscaping plan um, on site. I think we have, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, something like 1,400 trees that are going to be planted, and that's not counting um, all the other shrubs and plantings. That's correct. Yeah, and, and the number that we represented in the EAF for forested area removal is around 84.6 acres, so slightly less than what Bob quoted. If, if I could quote. I could follow up on that list. That was kind of uh, looking at that list. It was really impressive what you got there. Uh, what what I was curious about is uh, you have uh, a maintenance plan so that you are sure that these things do survive. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I heard portions of that. It sounded like you were asking if there was a maintenance plan for the plantings. Yes. Uh, yeah, typically there's a, there's, there's a survivability rate that, it, you know, obviously all plantings have to survive 
uh, two years after installation and then obviously maintained by the property thereafter. Uh, James, I'm not sure if you know if there's more specific or structured maintenance protocols in place that I'm well, unfamiliar with. Yeah, I, I can say this. I mean, the, the, under the general contractor's uh, construction contract, there'll be a one-year warranty for, for all plantings. We typically extend that for another year because uh, what happened, and, and usually hire the, the landscaper that installed the plantings to be the, the, uh, the maintenance contractor for those plantings so that there's no finger pointing after, you know, during that, during that one year period. And, and we usually extend that as well. So um, it, it's very important to, to this client and to us and that the landscaping uh, look very good. If this is a class A product, it's an institutional quality product. So um, I can tell you that the landscape design is excellent that, uh, that has been designed and is on the documents that you, you folks have access to. And uh, you know, it's, it, it's a it's a very good design and, and it's going to look very nice and you know we want it to be welcoming to uh, to the associates that work there and also look good for the community nearby. So we will we'll be paying a lot of attention to the maintenance and to the uh, and to the quality of those plants over their over their lifetime. Uh, James, I I fully agree with your comment. It looked very impressive, and I'm glad that you are you have a follow up plan. Thanks for your question. And this is Diane. I'd just like to throw in, I'm finally back on. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yep. We, we can hear you, Diane. Okay. No, I just wanted to compliment you on your landscaping plan. I took a lot of time looking at it, read over the species that you are planning to put in, and I appreciate there's a lot of diversity there's um, a lot of native species and and i was impressed so thank you for doing that so well You're welcome. that's all <laughs> well while we're on the landscaping plan so one of the things you know listening to the general public and, and everybody's concerned about noise and invisibility of a, a very large building um, was there any thought process into making some of the near the building some of the earthen barriers higher and then planting some trees on top of that? Because this building is extremely tall, right? And if we raise with with some earthen barriers and, and higher trees, because obviously the trees are going to take a while to grow, I mean it'll help reduce some of the noise, some of the pollution blowing across, some of the light. Just, just a, a general thought to help. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Uh, you know, where we could and in, in, in strategic locations, we have placed berms. Um, you know, given given the site design and, and the fact that um, we, we can't create two significant berms in, in close to the building just because there's most of our amenity space and or you know, truck access and access to the building. Uh, it makes it very difficult to do that. But, but where we could, we have. Okay. This might sound weird, but in, I've seen in uh, <clears throat> like Brazil and Costa Rica and stuff where they have uh, buildings, they actually grow, you know, like uh, vegetation and buildings where it, you know, it's applicable. And you know it provides more greenery. Just a comment. Okay. Uh, Paul, did you have any other questions? Yeah, I, I guess I had a, a few. Right. So just trying to keep obviously as environmental as we can, because obviously it's a huge impact to the area. Right. I, I mean, I know from going to, you know, traveling around to different places, you know, one of the things you're trying to do is is retain some of this runoff. H have we thought any process of putting in like toilets that use some of the rainwater for flushing to to help, you know, use some of that water that you've harvested in these ponds or that would be harvested in a cistern or something instead?
you know, it just, just a, a thought, you know, the same thing with the drainage for the, the trucks and the parking lots, right? It sounds like you've already got a mechanism trying to filter it into the ponds, but the water from the roofs, I would think would be much cleaner, you know, that, that going into the Creek, um, you know, would keep the creek a little bit cleaner as opposed to the the drainage from the pond or from the parking lot. So, you know, just, just trying to be careful of where we put the more contaminated water. Um, same thing with rain gardens, you know, the, the rain gardens for landscaping is, is another way to, you know, do things that I know it's a massive building, but I guess any little bit helps. Um, so, you know, I just had some, some thoughts to that. Uh, trying to mitigate. And, and the other one is I saw there was like 185,000 gallons or something in one of those. I, I don't have that number in front of me anymore, but you guys just had up the that 13 page document. Usage a day. I know we have sewer overflows today when we get heavy rainstorms. So I was just trying to figure out, you know, what the makeup of that water is. Um, is there any chemicals or anything in it and you know is it going to be handled by our sewer treatment and since we're already overflowing um you know several times a year on heavy rains you know this is just going to increase that issue so is there any way to sort of mitigate some of that hey uh, mike i was thinking if you want to walk through sort of the just zoom in maybe on this site plan and show where the parking lot drains in and, and how that water moves its way through the site. I mean, you guys have done a great job of, of managing that. And I think, you know, it's not always apparent to folks who aren't, who don't do this for a living, how that works. And, and I think maybe just a little explanation of how stormwater management works on this site would be helpful for everyone and could engage everybody and have more questions. Uh, certainly. Uh, I'd like to answer some of the other questions first, because I think they're a little easier um, so as far as reusing or harvesting of the rainwater for reuse in toilets, right now that is not factored into this plan. Um, and I'll leave it to James and, and others as to whether they want to, you know, take that back and, and think about it. Uh, and then relative to wastewater, it, it is all domestic in nature. Uh, there, there, as far as I'm aware, there's no chemicals that will be discharged into the waste stream. And the mitigation that we're proposing, understanding that you currently are under consent and have overflow issues, is a uh, we're contributing towards an I and I program, uh, inflow and infiltration program, which is uh, a a pay in lieu of four times our peak flow. So if our peak flow is, let's just say, thirty thousand gallons a day, four times that is the flow that we would be reducing with our INI funds for you to make improvements elsewhere in the town to offset the flow from this facility. So, so this facility would have no net impact, in fact, the positive on the sewer discharging discharge that's going on at the treatment plant. Um, so on storm management, sure, you know, we've, we have specific criteria that we have to follow, which is, uh, put out by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, New York State DEC, which basically says that we have to effectively micromanage or manage all runoff from impervious surfaces and disturbed surfaces uh, to some something that treats it for quality and then something that treats it for quantity. Uh, most of the time you'll find, and you mentioned rain gardens, they're very similar to bioretention systems. Effectively, it's the same technology. Uh, rain gardens are, are only effective for small impervious areas, not larger impervious areas, whereas biorotensions are meant to treat larger impervious sur surface areas, up to five, five to 10 acres is what they are allowed to intake from a development. So in our case, you know, we, we've taken quadrants of the parking and we send it to a bioretention area and then overflow that into a stormwater pond, which then overflows into a downstream system. We talked a bit earlier about how we, you know, we stage storage that flow in the pond 
uh, out controlling it through an outlet control structure and weirs to match pre-development flow rates. Uh, so, so that's effectively this area down here. Some of this area here goes to bioretentions on this side and overflows into the ponds here. Again, truck court area, bioretentions. Uh, some of these may actually overflow directly into the uh, feeder creek, which then bypass into our pond, fill up the pond, and then discharge on the downstream side. When you get to certain peak events, uh, in this case, I believe it's a 10-year storm, it, it bypasses here. Uh, it, it, actually, everything up to the 10-year event goes past the pond, everything else goes into our stormwater pond. So again, we've, we've effectively micromanaged every area. And then the building itself, half of it goes in, or a third of it goes into one here, here, and here. And then all of these routed into the stormwater pond here, down here for our driveway, into a bioretention here. And then we'll discharge actually out to a ditch that's a long, uh, long road. So again, I, th I think you know we, we can get into more um, engineering speak. I don't think that's necessary, but you, you know we've 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 managed all portions of the disturbed area through bioretention systems. In some cases, potentially low gradient swales where we'll have sediments drop out of those swales, which then go either to a bioretention yet again to be treated a second time or they'll discharge to the, you know, the discharge point of the feeder creek offsite. And this is in full compliance with the DEC's criteria. And we've had, you know, the town's engineering consultant review it as well and, and provide some comments, things that we've changed and modified and improved. Uh, but, but most of that has been in the technical details, not necessarily the logic or the treatment train or the practices that we've proposed. I think for the most part in those conversations that we've had, uh, they believe that we meet the, the guidelines set out by the DEC. Yeah, the, and those guidelines were developed over years of, you know, watching development not do a good job, I think of managing stormwater and, and having, as Mike mentioned, you know, not having a, a, a control over the, uh, the flow rates and the, and the time of concentration of of these of the water when it comes you know basically rainwater can can inundate these small streams and, and make them miserable so that's the whole idea behind detaining these waters but in addition to that you know with these parking areas and and pollutants and that sort of thing coming off of cars you know this this system is meant to really help uh clean that water it's it's not a hundred it's not a perfect system it's not going through a filtration system that's mechanized or anything like that but you know, the sediments drop out, as Mike, Mike said, <clears throat> the systems do tend to have a natural cleaning ability based on the plants that are planted there, et cetera. Just to address the one, one last uh, on, the, um, uh, on the issue of uh, rain harvesting for um, gray, gray water usage in the building, that's a great comment and it's, it's a thoughtful comment. And uh, as someone who lived in the third world and used use gray water for a number of years of my life. I, I, I can certainly respect it and understand it. But in a, on a facility like this, what that requires essentially is that two entirely separate plumbing systems be constructed inside the building. Because the potable water that we drink and use in our, in our bathrooms or restrooms for, for cleaning our hands and that sort of thing can't, can't be the same water that you use in the toilet in that, kind, in that scenario, you need a separate plumbing system. So, for the efficiency of literally getting water to restrooms for employees to use and that sort of thing. It, 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 it's just really cost prohibitive to have two entirely different systems, not to mention the cost of creating the cisterns that you mentioned that would store that and then pressurize that water and pump it to these systems. Because keep in mind that the potable water system is pressurized by the water tank on the island. And so it's, it's gravity fed and um, uh, you know, it, it, it just, it, it, there's so many complications to that for a facility of this size. I think it's a great concept for residential use and it's a great concept for smaller commercial uses, but this building um, is, is unfortunately just sort of too massive to have two sets of pipes everywhere within the structure. But I, I appreciate the question. That's very thoughtful. 
Yeah, my my only point was you you'll never do it if you don't do it when you're designing your building. Absolutely correct. Right. right. So so if it's not even you know considered because I've I've been to third world countries myself and several of the people on these calls have too. Right. So we've all experienced it and we know how precious water is and you yeah. know and and reusing is is a, a great way of you know helping the environment. Right. Agreed. Agreed. To kind of uh, piggyback off of Paul's question, I have a, just a comment and a suggestion. Um, on Grand Island, um, you know, we have definitely proven ourselves uh, willing to go the extra mile as far as create things that are environmentally friendly and green and, uh, you know, not try to be, um, you know, unimpactful on the environment as we possibly can. Um, you know, we see a, a building this big and we're like, wow, that's a lot of steel. That's a lot of concrete. Um, and there's a lot of things you can do with a structure like that to make it less impactful and fit our community's design. Um, you know, we would just ask that you consider some of these things that come up, things like, um, you know, the, the solar panel, the green roofs were mentioned, you know, the reusing of water. Um, you know, porous concrete, there's, there's so many modern environmental, uh, environmentally friendly designs um, and, and having a structure this big be put in the middle of a, a, a wet area, clay soil, wetlands, you know, uh, you, you're moving a stream, you, you've got a lot there that, that you're impacting and, you know, we're just uh, as a community about minimizing that impact on the environment. So. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of my comment. And those, those, sorry, those James. Good, those are good comments, Jeff. And, and I, I want you to know that we, we are trying to be uh, thoughtful and mindful about the development through, you know, not only adhering to the standards, but, um, you know, we, we, are, we are embarking, I think, nationally and, and our company is embarking on an embedded carbon program of understanding that the, it, it's complicated to, to sort of deal with that, but embedded carbon is a, is a big problem as it, turns, as it relates to climate change and emissions. And we have, a, we have a big program that we're working on internally for that. Um, this building has been designed structurally to handle a solar array on, on the roof. And we are working to try to uh, make that happen here as well to, to reduce the, the burden on the local grid. Um, so, you know, there are elements of this that, that do take place and, and when we evaluate the bids for, for steel and for concrete and that sort of thing, we do, do take into account the proximity of those sources and, uh, again, the emissions that come from that uh, and, and we'll look at some of those uh, competitively and, and uh, try to make sure that we use uh, our materials as efficiently as possible. Yeah, and, and to add to that, James, correct me if I'm wrong, our bike path is currently proposed as permeable pavement. Um, so oh, we, good. We good. have used that where where we thought suitable. So yeah, Jeff and James, can I jump in with a similar um, concern? Sure. Uh, yeah, I was, I was going to say that I was disappointed not to see any use of renewable energy in your plans. Um, as you know, New York State is, you know, has a couple of new laws about mandating a certain percentage of energy generation be by renewable sources. And we've also worked hard in the last few years to become a climate smart community. We've had solarized camp, a solarized campaign. And I would love to see I mean, it would speak volumes that you want to fit in with our environmental ethic here on Grand Island, that you either put some solar panels on your roof or uh, over the parking areas I've seen in other cities where they've built, you know, arrays that also allow people to park in the shade. <laughs> so I don't I'd like to hear that you'd consider some of that anyway. So um, that just seems really important to me as we move forward into this, you know, into our requirements in the state to meet a certain percentage of, and to lower our carbon footprint. 
Thanks, Diane. We appreciate that comment. We 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 are we're trying to be as green as we can within the within the budget and the constraints of the state. New York has has a great rebate program on renewables as well. So we are um, again taking a hard look at that, and um, we we appreciate your interest in it, and we'll take that to heart as we move forward here. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Did you have a question about that West parcel? Uh, can I follow up with a question on what you just talked about, the carbon footprint from sure. Jeff and Diane? Go ahead. Are, are you going to calculate the, uh, the carbon footprint using like EPA standard calculations? And could you look at the number with and without solar panels and see what kind of impact it would have on the carbon footprint? And then just take all their inputs from the warehouse, auxiliary facilities, and transportation, and just see what that number looks like and compare it to maybe some type of uh, facility that's similar. That's about it. Jim, you're ahead of your time. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of calculators for, for calculating carbon. Um, in, a, in a project, and as I mentioned, you know we're we're trying to sort through that right now. Um, that there are a, a, just so so many sources, and we all recognize that uh, you know we're trying to beat a 1.5 degree Celsius uh, temperature rise around the planet. And uh, again, it's not it's not lost on us as one of the largest developers in the country that we have a, a large role to play in the development of these projects. Around the, around the world, around the country and around the world. So um, I, I can't tell you that we're gonna get a carbon footprint calculation done before uh, we hopefully have this project approved, but I, I will tell you that we are looking at those tools and we are gonna start making that a requirement of our projects. This is something that uh, our executive committee um, is, is interested in and is, and is starting to calculate in terms of our corporate responsibility as a company. And um, I happen to, to lead the sustainability program for the Trammell Crow Company nationally. And, uh, and we're, we're trying to improve upon that. And, and it's an important part of our, um, of our program. Of course, you know, COVID-19 and some of these other, the, the economy and that sort of thing are, are taking precedent right now. We're trying to get through that and keep our employees employed and keep our projects moving forward. But um, it, it is something that's at the, the top of the list for our executive committee and our leadership of our company. So um, appreciate your comments. And um, I, I, at, right, at this point, I, I can't promise that we'll have a, a carbon number. I'm not sure what the meaning, how meaningful it would be anyway, but um, it, it is certainly something we're looking at. And I think the thing that we can focus on here is, is trying to see if we can get solar on this, on this building. and, and uh, make that a contribution to, uh, to the environment. Thank you. You're welcome. I uh, have a question for Kim. Is Kim still there? Yep, I'm still here. Uh, you mentioned that it's about 0.8 acres of uh, wetland that would be mitigated. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the mitigation. What are the plans for the mitigation? So, um, you know, Mike, do you want to just give a summary of where things stand with discussions um, with the core? I will say what the proposed mitigation is the, the purchase of wetlands credits, but perhaps this is a good time for Mike to just jump in and say where things stand in terms of our um, with the, along with the permitting process. Yeah, I think I'm actually going to turn that over to Bob March. He would Cover that much no better. <laughs> sure, guys. So, so what we presented to the Army Corps and the DEC in terms of mitigation was, as Kim said, the purchase of an equal number of credits from the Ducks Unlimited in lieu fee program. They basically use that contribution to build wetlands within this watershed. Um, and on top of that, the site plan calls for the creation of about 2.3 acres of floodplain wetlands next to the relocated stream. And as I said before, the relocated stream itself adds about 100 linear feet of waterway to the site. So um, we've gotten limited feedback from the Army Corps. You know, the, as Kim said, the application was just submitted in April and with the COVID 
situation here, things aren't moving super fast. But what they have told us is that what we've presented seems reasonable to them, but they're required to reach out and engage other interested agencies as well, including the EPA, um, before they can give us the, the thumbs up to move forward with a full mitigation design based on that conceptual approach. Uh, but it's going to be within within the, the watershed that you're in. Correct. Yes, the 2.3 acres of creation will be on site, and yep. the credit purchase is um, essentially a contribution toward the creation of wetlands in the Niagara River watershed. In, 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 on Grand Island? Uh, probably not. I don't know about Grand Island specifically. The way the program is set up and approved by the Army Corps is that it's just within the Niagara River watershed. Thank you. But, sure. Go ahead, Suzanne. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I have a question regarding the um, Western parcel. It was mentioned earlier that it's largely wetlands and isn't considered desirable for future development. But I think, I know the suggestion has been made before by the county in, in a review of the documents the possibility of the developer deeding that land to a conservancy. So we work closely with Western New York Land Conservancy or perhaps to the town to provide some assurance to West River residents that that um, would you know, continue as a buffer. And I was thinking um, you know, the number of questions about wildlife and, and cutting off buckhorn, but it would seem to me that if that corridor could could somehow be guaranteed to not be developed, um, that that could provide habitat for the wildlife that is obviously going to be out of a home and um, could also serve as a corridor to buckhorn. And I'm wondering if the developer or the owner is receptive to that idea. So I'll jump in here. Um, we're, you know, there's been a, a couple of separate submissions talking about this blast parcel. So let's just start at the beginning. So. Okay. When we originally presented, we were talking about the 62 acre West Parcel. So what we refer to as the West Parcel, it runs right along the zoning boundary line. So to the West, it's zoned R1A, it's M1, um, where our site is. We're about 145 acres, the West Parcel is 62. As of right now, there are no plans for a TC to purchase that parcel to the West, which is zoned R1A. Uh, but we have been having a discussion with the town the, the we hear the concerns in terms of the value as a buffer. We are not proposing any development on that site, but obviously if we are not purchasing it, we can't uh, prevent, you know, whatever development may happen in the future. That being said, there is detailed information provided um, in our filings, which talks about what could actually be done at that site if there were any development. Um, essentially 70% of the site will remain undevelopable due to the presence of New York State wetlands and the 100 foot buffer area. So no matter what would happen, that area of the site has to remain undeveloped because of the presence of New York State wetlands. Uh, with respect to the remaining 30%, when you factor in um, you know, the underlying zoning requirements, stormwater needs, that type of thing, the max you could get at that site is about five residential lots. Um, and we did include a detailed analysis uh, in our materials of that. So most of that parcel, whether or not we, you know, there's a conservation easement on it will remain undevelopable. But as of right now, there is no plan to purchase that portion, um, which would, you know, give rise to conservation easements, anything along those lines. Um, we have a subdivision application in with the town and those conversations remain ongoing. We have heard those comments, those questions. Um, we, we still return to the fact that the majority of the site is undevelopable even without us purchasing it, um, but we are continuing those discussions as well. I have maybe um, a question that might relate to that as well, although maybe not. <laughs> um, I know in reading about everything there, you mentioned there are 36 acres of meadows, which will become 51 acres. Um, my question is, 
um, where are those meadows? Is it something that is a large enough area that could actually be maintained and managed as wetlands to bring back some of our bird species like the short-eared owl that like that kind of habitat and bobolinks and a few others? I, I don't know. I don't know if the wetlands are all in different or meadows are all in different spots. Can someone reply to that? Um, I, I believe those areas are in and around, you know, the relocated creek, uh, areas like this, everything that's shaded in and around the ponds that aren't going to be um, wet and will just be effectively one area that won't be fully maintained or mowed. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't, I can't speak to the second half of your question. I don't know, Bob, if you can. Um, I'll only add that, you know, based on literature that's out, that is available, the short-eared owl requires at a minimum of 10 acres of unfragmented grassland to really consider it suitable habitat. And I, mm. don't, you know, that's just not available on this site, pre or post okay. condition. Okay. Thank you for answering that. Okay. Uh, we've gone through uh, a lot of questions. Uh, CAB members, do you have anything else uh, that you would like to um, address at this time? I, I do. I get a bunch of questions. Just then, uh, the uh, did the project respond to uh, Whitney's comments in conjunction with uh, the GHD submitted it? They're on uh, fire protection, et cetera. Has there be response made to, to GHD on the questions that uh, they have? Yeah, so that fourth supplement that was filed in June um, responds to comments received from DHD. Okay. I assume that the all the fire protection systems meet NFPA codes and maintenance programs, right? Yes. Because there's maintenance programs in those NFPA standards too. And the other thing is just a question. Are alarms, how are you going to manage alarms? Are the alarms going to go back like if you have a fire to to responders and if so yes or you have have you talked to them about it um we've i can't speak to the alarm system directly right now um uh, but we have had extensive discussions with uh the grand island fire department um there's a specific fire engineer that um develops this the fire system in here which is extensive um, there are two water tanks and two separate lines inside and outside the building um, that service the fire protection system. And we have had several discussions and will continue discussions with Grand Island Fire um, going forward about the system. Okay, I'll move on to the next one. This is kind of weird. Uh, you know, what does COVID uh, have safety precautions been uh, taken into account in design? of the building and protection of a thousand workers and hence you know the protection of uh, the general public are there any standards now that came out from the state the federal or <clears throat> county so that it, we don't it's not like the you know the meat cutters out out west or kind of yeah problems. we're 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 going to avoid uh, slaughtering any animals inside our. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, um, I like that. <laughs> and, and we do have an automated inoculation system that we'll have in place so everyone will get an injection as they walk into the building. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, I, ju I just, I <laughs> just, at a time when it uh, shouldn't be too funny, but. You know, we, we as, as developers of buildings, we constantly look at ways to keep people safer and, and our, what our clients are demanding and um, auto, automated door systems, touchless door systems, touchless elevators are all the rage right now. You probably can't buy one of those things if you wanted to today. 
um, because people in office buildings in particular are extremely conscious of, of, of the virus and, and germs and bacteria in general is becoming a heightened awareness thing. But, um, you know, it, the, the client here, the, the tenant that we're working with is extremely conscious of the health of their, of their associates and their employees. Um, without them being healthy, then the business doesn't work. So I would say that there probably isn't because, because there are so many employees in this company, they, they have a, a, one of the more rigorous programs on the planet really for, for maintaining the health of, the, of their employees. And the last thing that, um, you know, they want to see happen is to have a, 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 a hotspot develop as a result of their building. I mean, you're right. There's a thousand, you're going to be a thousand employees in this, in this, in this building and they'll be coming and going through the same 20 doors out front. So um, I, I, I can refer you, as a matter of fact, uh, there, there is uh, some legitimate uh, language that's been submitted with our IDA application about that very topic that was submitted today. And um, all I can tell you is that, that we're conscious of it and it's in our best interest as well as Grand Island's best interest to have a system that um, is, is extremely safe and, and sanitary and, and, and deters the spread of any uh, disease. Thanks. Thanks for that response and no meat cutters. We'll, we'll do our best. <laughs> Just, uh, I got two other little comments is the comment on having a field walkthrough and that uh, bus stop, I'm glad to see it's being re relocated, you know, right near the doors because that, that was a comment I had. The other thing is uh, along, you know, the, the front road there, there on uh, what what's the name of the road is? Uh, Long road. Yeah, Long road. Are are there going to be like uh, you know like bike paths maybe from the, the 190 past the area where the trucks are going to enter, so that they can go on a sidewalk or a protected zone. Jim, you're 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 reading our mind. Um, we are we are we are investigating right now, connecting the, the bike path that we've already committed to extends from Long Road to Bell to Bedell Road, and we are investigating connecting that bike path not to the east to the 190, but to the west to where you already have a newly created uh, bike path along uh, West River Road. So we, we're looking into that right now as as a uh, as, as one of the things that we, we may want to supply and, and contribute to the project where we're trying to figure out whether we can we can do it within the realm of our, our budget. But we see that as a win for your community, for your ecotourism business that you're, you're, you're trying to promote. And Mr. Marsden has been uh, been talking to me about that. And and also as a as a win for our employees. Who, who, you know, hopefully some of which will live on your island, on the island and, and uh, utilize uh, bicycles as, uh, as a means of transportation to the, to the, to the site here. So th we, think, we think it's a win uh, in all regards and, and we are looking into it right now. We can't make any promises, but it's certainly something that's, that's on our list and, and Mike and his team are, are doing some analysis of that right now. That's great. Thank yeah. you. And that's, that's it for my comments. Just, yeah, just, I, I had the same, same comment, right? I asked if there was going to be some bike racks because you have car parking and things like that. If you're going to be bike racks. For, oh, we'll, oh, we'll definitely have bike racks. We'll definitely have okay. bike racks. It, sure. it, and then the, you, even though you're going west, which is awesome to connect to the, the bike trail because it's a great bike trail. I know I ride over that bridge going east and and it's, it's not a big bridge and with big trucks, th that's where you really need to get to the town because you're not near town center. The only way you can go to town center is over the bridges. Right. Right. So, so that's really, if you, if you want people to bike there, the majority of the people are going to come from the populated side, which is across those bridges. I see. So if any consideration can be given to, to helping the bikers out, that would be wonderful. That's, that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, we'll look at that. And just to follow up on Jim Zelpa's question about doing a walkthrough, um, could we schedule a walkthrough or could we just go ahead and do a walkthrough on the property as a, as a committee? 
Just we don't we don't currently own the property, so we would have to we would have to talk to the property owner. Um, Kim, I don't know. What do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, we we'd have to give it some consideration as to to figure out you know timing and when it could happen. But we can we can look into that. Okay, it's pretty tip, typical that that's what we'd end up doing in most projects, in mm -hmm. especially a project this size. That's what we'd want to do. So if you could get back to Jeff and I, myself about that. We'll do. We can do that. Yeah. For scheduling. Or if you can just give us permission that that's what we're seeking. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, you, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to Mr. Huntress about that and get back to you. I have a question. Um, if someone could speak to and describe in a little more detail the plans for the limiting of the visual impact of the building, the screening. Um, basically my question has to do with whether or not this is going to be accomplished by the time needed for for tall tree growth or does it include um, elevation and perspective um, berms that type of thing um, are we going to have to wait for for tall trees to grow before this is screened uh, the visual impact is reduced or or what so so I'll speak I'll start by speaking to that and then Mike can jump in as he wants um, you know Generally speaking, you're going to see the building from the 190, for example. The, you're going to see the building. We're not trying to hide that. Um, what, what we have been demonstrating and what's in our initial visual analysis that was submitted in that first filing in February is that the visual impacts are mitigated. You know, We're not saying you're not going to see the building, but the size of the site alone and the significant setbacks are what's helping reduce that visual impact, not making it look as substantial despite the fact that it's a large building because of the way that the building is situated on the site. And that's part of the reason why the site was selected. The size of the site um, works with the scale of the building. So that's, that's the main point. And then with respect to the visual analysis, um, there were photos taken from areas that are considered sensitive receptors. Um, and if you look at those photos, the facility is not visible from those locations. So a, a lot of it has to do with just the size of itself, the, the site itself and the orientation of the building and not necessarily relying on the growth of mature trees to fully screen the facility. That being said, the substantial landscaping plan is meant to add to the you know, aesthetics of the site itself, but we're not relying on the growth of trees to screen the building, if that makes sense. It does, thank you. Uh, how, um, how tall is the water tank? About 37, Here, I believe. 37 feet? Yes. Okay, I just wondered about that, okay. How I would imagine the water tank would be sky blue painted. Is that correct? I don't know the color right no. now. I, I don't think that's true, Mike. The, 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 the water tanks are ground mounted. They're not, they're not towers like you, you normally think of in terms of a municipal water supply. So they, they're just on the ground and they'll, they'll probably be painted the same color as the building, which will actually cause them to pretty much disappear into the building. Um, for, uh, an idea for Mike and and uh, and Kim, is it is it possible to uh, when we talk about that west uh, the property to the west, uh, the cost of mitigation, is it possible you could influence the uh, Army Corps and to to uh, do the mitigation by purchasing that property with the mitigation? You mean in lieu of buying uh, wetland credits, just buy that property and, and, and instead? Yes. You still have to replace the wetlands that, that we are taking on this site, which are very small, as, as already has already been discussed. So you'd still have to, even if it was on that property, you would you'd have to uh, work there. So it, it doesn't really help us in that regard. The, the credits are actually a, a good idea because it helps with the construction of new wetlands in locations that are already de-restricted in, in some way, shape, or, or form, and also builds builds them in in quantities that allow them to be, um, you know, to survive to survive better. Right? If you built very a lot of small wetlands, the chances of them, you know, promulgating the correct species of plants, et cetera, 
are, are less favorable. So uh, we, we think that the, cre the credits uh, idea is actually um, is a good one and, and provides the best outcome for the community. Thank you. Welcome. You're welcome. I, I would like to just say, um, I really appreciate that you have spent time with us to answer some really specific and important questions. And um, I just appreciate all of your expertise. And I just wanted to say thank you. Well, as, as, as a developer, you know, I've been doing this for 22 years now. Um, I, I, I'll tell you that I've never actually met with a con conservation advisory board as uh, both <laughs> thought and thoughtful as this. I've, met, I've certainly met with the public in many, many cases, but uh, the fact that Grand Island has a conservation advisory board is, is to be uh, commended. And uh, the fact that you've come up with uh, some, some very thoughtful and, uh, in, in Jim's case, very crazy uh, questions, I think are, uh, is, is admirable. <laughs> we, we, don't, we, don't mind, uh, we don't mind the scrutiny and, uh, and we, we wanna build a project that, uh, that the community can be proud of as well. Just to echo what Diane said, uh, we do appreciate you coming out and I'm sure we're gonna see your responses, um, especially if the town hires an environmental consultant, we'll see you respond to the consultant um, we'd like to keep an open communication and to have, have you respond in, in, in this type of venue to us too, um, because, you know, with consultants, sometimes you don't know, um, you know, what they're going to find. And so I'm sure we're going to have more questions as we discover more information. Um, thank you very much for coming out. Um, uh, you've answered all of our, our questions and it gave us a lot to think about. And um, I'm just going to just do a, a final, um, you know, I, I'm looking at the time right now and, and we've gone longer than the public hearing on this project. And so you, you've answered a, a, a lot here and uh, um, uh, we appreciate that. So anybody else? Uh, I, I you thank you too. I think you did a very thoughtful job and that you have the environmental at your heart. And it's good to see on the design. And uh, I'm hopefully you just answer the questions that we have and, you know, it goes ahead. I'd like to add, uh, thank you as well uh, for your time. Uh, we st will probably still have more questions, obviously. Uh, this is a pretty big project. Um, and with that, Jeff, I think we're concluded with this part of the meeting, so the um, TC Buffalo uh, Project Dallas folks can leave, and then we should continue with the meeting from there. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you for coming thank in. Thank you. I appreciate the information. Thank yep. you. <clears throat> okay. And that's Diane on the phone. So I think we got everybody. I Is think we're down to yep. just us. So we're good to go. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, just a quick synopsis. Uh, the town has not hired an environmental consultant yet. Um, you know, I, they, they've been responding to consultants, but I'm not sure what information. We haven't seen any. Um, so Mike, you said that this is going to happen tomorrow. Does the town board need some advice? I, I, am, I am going to bring the topic up tomorrow. I really ex thought that we had already done it. So I need to find out what the status is. If they need a motion, we're going to do it. Um, I'm pretty sure though it's already done. So I'm not sure why we haven't yet. Maybe they needed to get all the information together from all the, the work that TC has been doing, but I'm not sure why we do not have that already in place. So I got to follow up on that tomorrow morning. 1130. That'll be an open public meeting. So would you like a motion to do so in our minutes? That would wouldn't hurt. I would entertain a motion for the town to hire an environmental consultant uh, to determine uh, the extent, uh, the impact of Project Olive. So moved. Oh, and second. Maybe, all right. Who? <laughs> who? Who said it first? I think somebody. All right, so Alice, Alice. 
suggested Ellis made the movement. Suzanne yes. second. Uh, let's see. All in favor. Jeff Green, aye. Aye. Sam, aye. All aye. Diane, aye. <laughs> aye. Are alternates voting today? Uh, let's see. Ellis hopped in. Ellis says aye. And so Liz, you can vote. Aye. Okay. All right. Jeffrey, run the motion back at me again verbatim so that I my phone started going crazy with uh, a motion to encourage the town board to hire an environmental consultant to determine the impact of project dollar. Gotcha. You can say environmental impact of project dollar would do it. That way we'll have the motion in our minutes. Um, okay, so uh, we're obviously going to come back and revisit this. This is an ongoing project and if something comes up, we will uh, discuss it. Do- uh, I guess, I guess um, just advisement to the town board as well. You just did the one motion. My question would be, is there anything you wanna capture in your meeting minutes that you wanna to convey to the town board relative to this? Or do you need to, you may even wanna meet separately just to provide to put a summary together, I, I guess. How do you want to go about doing that? Because we will need to write them our recommendations after meeting with uh, the Project Olive people. Is that what you're saying, Mike? Yeah. If, for example, um, Jeff brought up a great point about the baseline for uh, pollution, noise pollution, oh, yeah. and everything else. I, I think there was a number of things that were brought up. Um, that you may want to make sure the environmental conservation con um, consultant or whoever um, somehow at least looks at and confirms whether it's a concern or not. Okay. We may want to give just an idea. We may want to give an environmental consultant the list of questions that we prepared tonight. I don't know. Just a thought. Uh, Good I, idea. I would uh, I would agree to that. Um, uh, do, should we do that in official capacity without the environmental consultant being hired yet, or should we wait until they're hired and then just issue the letter? Well, just just a comment about this whole thing. We are trying to get an environmental impact statement, and the town hasn't hired an environmental consultant. Why? Um, I well, we, I need to ask that question tomorrow, so I, I don't have the answer at this point. There, there may be a reason. We have we have the the long seeker form that's already been submitted. Just to throw that out there, we do have lists and emails of questions and things we would like an environmental consultant to <laughs> um, to perform. And we can send that at any time. Um, I, I think, for, you know, if you've already put a good list of questions that you would like further investigation on, especially for environmental kind of consultant, um, it wouldn't hurt to forward that to the town board as part of your motion that you just did, perhaps, or separate from that. Okay. Um, uh, I will entertain a motion. You got it ready, Tom? Yeah. Entertain a motion to send the town board a uh, list of items to be considered by our environmental consultant. Got it. Anybody want to make the motion? I'll, I'll motion that we do. Okay, so do I have a second? Second. Alice, second. How about uh, a little discussion? <laughs> would you like it? Like. Well, I just think um, that what we prepared, I don't know, do we want to give every single, give all of it, or do we want to summarize it, or, yeah, I'm not uh, clear. The best. I, I'm not, I agree, Diane. I mean, I put in questions like, you know, sediments for the creek, but 
then they said basically the creek's dry half the time. So, you know, that comment right. probably doesn't really mean anything. But without knowing that, I had no idea how much water was in the creek, right? Right, right. And well, we yeah, got a lot of questions answered. I wouldn't necessarily yeah. remove that. I, I think having a complete review of that creek and the creek bed and everything else would be <clears throat> advisable. So I, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily eliminate that question. Maybe yeah. you got to go through and sanitize them and uh, and get the ones that really in, that you want to submit. Okay, um, so the motion was just to send the list. Um, we can, uh, I don't have to send it tonight or tomorrow, but if we want to just take a few days and hone that list down and just get it, uh, edit it to town board standard um, and and then I can send it. So um, we did make, I think that's and it's on the table, but I won't send it until, we'll, we'll, is a week good enough or would you like it a little quicker, Mike? Would it? Um, the next meeting is a week from Monday. If you can have it by the end of next week, that'd be great. Okay, so we have, we'll just say one week. Next Thursday night, I will send it. And um, there are some things on that document that, questions that were asked that weren't on that document also. So I wanna make sure that that document includes all of our concerns. So um, just make your motion that after further editing um, and summarizing, um, you you have the approval to forward that as an advisement from the, the Conservation Advisory Board, those questions. Okay, so uh, Tom, if you wanna add after uh, editing the list, we'll send that to the town board. Let me read it. Uh, go for it. After editing the list, we will send the town board list of items to be considered by our environmental consultant. Yeah, you can just say after editing, and then that way list isn't there twice. Oh yeah, right. There we. As I was reading it. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Uh, so we had the motion. We had the second. Um, Jeff, I. Right. Diane, aye. All aye. Tom, aye. Jim? He's, I think he said aye. He's muted, though. And then uh, Liz. Aye. There we are. OK. Oh, well, Alice says aye. Alice, there you are. Okay, and so that catches us up with Project Olive. Um, I didn't quite catch the, um, the way you voted there, Jeff, but I wanna confirm it would be, cause I think we have all nine primary members. So the alternatives really wouldn't vote on this one. No, Liz, Liz would because we don't have Ed. Oh, okay, sorry. I missed that yep. we were missing one. Okay, got it, thanks. You won't. Okay, um, the next, Try to keep updated. There's a lot of stuff coming through. Um, what I'm noticing, and, and I should have suggested this to them before they left, is that in a lot of their documentation, there are no dates, times, and who did it, um, especially with environmental stuff. There's just a sheet of paper with a list of species. And then on the second page is a, is a list of species that says in 1990. So that original cover sheet, which they're saying was done with the latest delineation in 2019, you had no idea what date that was done on. Um, things are not as specific. There's just, there's a lot of stuff in the documents that is not detailed. Um, so we wanna make sure that, um, you know, these, the, the environmental um, information has sources um, and we can trace those sources back. So Jeff, for that, one of the questions on the sheet that you're gonna provide, just say, we would like to request um, the date performed and performed by for each one of the lists that you're referring to. Yes. Yeah. So actually call that out or so include that on your, in the document you're gonna provide. And I think that's a great point because they're saying it's not from 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Let's have the documentation to show that. Trust, but verify. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move along. We've been at, we've been on for a few hours. This is a long meeting, even online. Uh, 
upcoming project review. Mike, do you want to, uh, I, and I'm sure you're saying this for the town board, but I put project reviews on here. Anything upcoming that we should be aware of? So um, there's two things that will come up at our next meeting. One is the South Point project. Um, we'll have them just like what we just went through, actually present the project as provided they accept our invite. The other is, I hate to do two in one night. Um, I guess I would ask this committee, do we wanna do two in one night? And the other would be the solar park. I don't think we did the solar park at, at Elvin and Whitehaven. Is that correct? I, we never had them review it with us, right? Not the one at Elvin. We did the right. one We did the one at um, Bedell Whitehaven. and Stoney, but not, right. not the one at Elvin. So I would assume that you wanna review it. So. Um, I would put out an invite and we would do two in one night if you're, if everyone's okay with that. <laughs> the, the other option would be we do it during an off session. Right. Um, maybe I'll, like we were trying to do the, you know, definitely we're, we're not trying to do like South Point and Project Olive on one night, but I will put that option out there. Um, if we can perhaps do South Point on its own, maybe. Or, or if they want our meeting, if they accepted that invitation that was sent, maybe the solar park another night, um, just because it's been two hours and 10 minutes. So we'll... So are you speaking of our next regularly scheduled meeting? Yes. Is that what you're... Okay. So yeah, we that, should probably expect... In a time... Sorry. I'm just wondering in a, if we wait too long do we miss our opportunity to comment or we could do it before. i mean i i just i don't know i'm just throwing that out there um the timing of our evaluation i don't know where it falls in with everything else that needs to be done so well south point is just coming back online okay. as of a couple days ago or just recently. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it's our cycle. They, they, they didn't make this agenda, so. Okay. I was just so they're gonna... coming back to the town board? Yes, they've come back and they're seeking. So um, if you recall a while ago, they, they had actually communicated that they'd done, done the delineation. They were asking for approvals. Um, they indicated that no significant impacts. They, they didn't expect any significant impacts. We were waiting to right. hear back from the DEC. It turns out there were significant impacts. So they had to redo the okay. plan. So they've redone I the see. plan and okay. really were, um, we have to relook at the, the, the entire process we have to go through again. Oh, okay. So the town board is, okay, never mind. Never mind. I was, I was going to say that if they will post the documents just like they did for this one, then it's it's it's, it's, uh, it's quite possible we can do both in one night. I'm I'm not against it. I'm up for whatever whatever it works best for everybody. So yeah, it's okay South with Point me. It's a pretty big project, so I mean I would expect that it may take this long. So and it's oh. a pretty green spot that they're in. Yeah. So I, I guess. Okay. Maybe we keep that one on this night definitely, and then we talk to the solar people. And if they're willing to do an earlier date, we can we can definitely try to accommodate that. Um, do we have plans plans for the South Point that uh, we can look at? And maybe if we did, you know, is there anything there that you could do similar what you just did today and put comment together? Or are we going right. to wait for them? It worked out well today. Um, I will do something like that. Mike, just so you know, I, what I did was I just made a, a living document with a list of questions. So that way we weren't all asking the same questions. We were able yeah, to- Yeah, it was preparation questions. for tonight's meeting. So that's perfectly fine. Yeah. As so, long as you're not making decisions or um, you know, just compiling information, is what, which is what you were doing, that is acceptable to do. Yes. So that- Decision making or- officially submitting a document is something we we need to do that in an open public meeting. We can't do that through email and what have you, just so everyone's aware of that in open public meetings wise, yeah. law wise. We just wanted to make sure that, you know, we all didn't come to the table with the same question. Yeah, so so 
in preparation for a meeting where you're going to be doing this that in open public that's totally acceptable to do so don't hesitate to do that for south point or anything or any other project all right so um we will we will find out about the the solar plant and we're waiting for south point to get back to us um, almost sounds like you know i don't expect the solar project to take as long but maybe we could do that as an off meeting if um if that's a thought for the team I, or if you want to do it both on the same night it's up to you okay well let's Although see let's that see one's what, a lot closer well, to being I, ready to go yeah let's see what's best for them first too if they want to uh, you know if they want to get in front of us sooner then we i think can they do accommodate yeah. that as long as we have at least five members um uh that can attend um we should as long as we have a quorum um okay. We right. will be able to do that. Was there a uh, walk walk through done at South Point or Solar Park at this point by the board? I, I think we'd have to ask them for that. Yes, we there is not been one. We haven't. Uh, was South Point the last time it came up? It just never got to that point where we did a walk through. Um, it just kind of went into hibernation. And now um, right. we'll, we'll talk to the landowners and developers to see if that is a possibility. All right, um, I'm gonna continue. Uh, Western New York Land Conservancy project update. Um, many of you uh, attended that meeting. What did you think? Um, can somebody just give a brief overview of, of what happened at that meeting? You want to do it, Diane? Uh, sure. <laughs> I was just thinking we should email. Um, you know how Kyle took minutes and sent them to everybody who was at the meeting. We could send those out to all of our members that weren't able to be at the meeting. I, I can do, I can do that. Or did send them to me too, Diane? Okay, I will. Um, that's yeah, because that was a good summary. I thought it was a great meeting. They have um, progressed really well with their efforts um, to notify private landowners. They've got three projects right now that uh, the landowners have actually signed off on. Um, two of them are... Uh, Gosh, I don't have that stuff in front of me. Have the BOS um, property on oh, yeah, the BOS property um, on Love Road is one of the parcels, which we're quite excited about. Um, the BOS wants to sell it uh, to the Land Conservancy, and they've signed an agreement. Um, let's see, where was one of the others? They had the funk <laughs> property on Snelly Road. Um, right. Let me, I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared to talk about it. That, that's okay. We're Can just looking for a brief summary because I do have one thing that I want to add um, after we okay. get to the, the summary. Let me, um, I've got it right here. Well, so anyway, there, it's, about eight, it's 10, progressing. Nine, it's, go ahead, Tom. Well, it's just, it's, it's basically near the Alt Road Paper Street and the town's water line that crosses Staley. And I would say it's about eight tenths of a mile to the west of baseline, south side of Staley Road. That was the two parcels that they had made the most progress with at this point. So there's actually, so I just got a, I just pulled it up. There's a summary of, there's 44 acres on Love Road. This is currently owned by the Buffalo Ornithological Society. I don't know if anyone knows where that piece of property is. Right next to Pete Marsh. Yeah, we... Yes, that is correct. Next one is 36 acres at 2489 Whitehaven Road. Mm -hmm. um, and that butts up, if I'm not mistaken, against the cemetery property, the, the large piece that already is owned by the Conservancy or whatever, if however you would term that. And the last piece of property is 10.5 acres at 2500 Staley Road. Um, this is adjacent to the town-owned 39-acre Love Road Forest property. So those are the three that are currently in 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 the works. I, this project, I would mention at that meeting that uh, 
it was attended by <laughs> members of the town board. All, all our council men were there, or council members, I should say. And uh, they had a lot, <laughs> sorry, Alice. And they had a lot of, uh, they had a lot of interesting questions and comments. So it was really good to see that. Yes, it was, it was great. So I received a phone call from Kyle and um, he is looking for the CAB um, to just issue a letter of support to the Greenway Council for these, these particular properties. Um, I'm, I, I have no problem sending one. I uh, just want to run it by the board. Um, uh, Mike, is this something I need to make a motion? It's not for advisement for the town, but. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, since you're sending a letter representing the Conservation Advisory Board, you should pass a motion saying that they approve you drafting a letter of support. Mike, just to chime in, sorry guys. Um, John, the town board has already authorized John to sign a letter of the town board's approval. So if you guys, I, I don't know that you need to do one recommending that we adopt it, but if the Conservation Advisory Board itself wanted to send one to the Land Conservancy, I think that would be appropriate. The town board- That's what has they've requested, yes. That's what they request. Yeah, they called. Right. They called and just wanted uh, letter of support from the CAB also. So, um, I will entertain a motion to send a letter of support for. The wait, wait. What's that? I have a question about the letter of support. What What are we saying that we're supporting? If, just that they continue with the project. Yeah, if you check your email, um, you can see what see what's there. Oh, okay. Okay. Basically, you're you supporting. Something? The concept of them forever green, um, reserving that land basically by whatever means they're using. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about right. that. So no, I'll second you, start running by me again. Yeah, so I get it down. Okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to send a letter of support uh, to the Greenway Project for the Western New York Land Conservancy and adopting those properties. So moved. I'll second it. Sam and- I got a message saying joining, joining the meeting is timing out. So I might be disconnected just so you know. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, supposed to go till 10, so that shouldn't time out. <laughs> Um, so the motion's on the floor. Aye. Second. Aye. Second it. Aye. Tom, aye. We, we have we heard from uh, Paul? Yeah, aye. And Liz? Aye. And did we lose Suzanne? Yeah, I think we lost Suzanne. All right, Jerry. <laughs> hey, all right. I'm you up. The, you, you, uh, Very high. There you go. All right. Uh, motion carried. Oh, and Alice said I forgot yeah. Alice. Sorry, Alice. <laughs> she was waiting to be called on there. <laughs> I, I like hearing my name. <laughs> does, does that mean does that Jerry can vote as well? Tom DeGotti, did you say that the town board has issued or will be issuing a similar letter of support? We already have. Okay. Okay. All right. Jeff, I did have one other item. Actually, uh, Tom Degatti reminded me. Uh, there was the issue regarding the creek and the, the some concerns. And actually, Tom, since you're on the call, um, I know that the, the the Parks and Rec Department has expressed some interest or or what have you. If you could just ex explain what they're <clears throat> what they're seeking. Yeah, um, in this, so this dates back to just before COVID, but the Parks and Rec Advisory Board had brought up the creek at uh, the Town Commons, and there was an award-winning design that was done, and since then there's been some no uh areas put into place, and it's essentially largely become overgrown rather than following along with the design that was met, and they were wondering if we could what the conservation advisory board's position would be to try and clean that up a little bit, get the water moving because it's stagnant. Um, and Diane or Sue, I forgot which, provided kind of an interim response because I think it may have been after our February meeting and neither board had met um, for basically since then. So 
they just wanted to uh, bring that issue back up and see if the board as a whole could issue any more guidance on what we might be able to do to get that area cleaned up. Would there be any interest in us uh, taking a look at it first? Uh, would, would we be able to get out there and take a look and then make our recommendations? Would that be a adequate thing to do? I, I think that would be great. And if you want, I can um, talk to Chairwoman Schmidt and have, you know, she has copies of the plans and stuff. And perhaps you guys can take a look at the plans and, and go take a look at the creek and then, and then get back and see if we can formulate a plan of attack. I talked to- I feel like that's where we were before COVID. Uh, we, we had talked about getting out there and then all this happened. That is yeah, what- and that's understandable. Was, right? She just wanted to make sure it didn't uh, slip through the cracks. So if you guys could do that, that would be great. And, and they'll await your response. Okay. And I, I feel confident that we can, it sounds like a, it should be attended to once or twice a year you know, it can be thinned out a little and check for invasives and stuff like that. So I think it's a great idea to move forward with that. And yeah, that was one of the issues specifically was whether or not there were invasive species in there that might be able to be removed to thin it out. And so that would be great. Um, and like I said, I'll, if you need anything else from, from Chairwoman Schmidt, I'm sure she'd be happy to provide it. Um, otherwise, we'll let okay. you uh, Jeff, do you, who's who's going to meet with who? Okay, so I think <laughs> I think we should. I mean, we have to do this safely, social distancing. And, yes. And, but I, I would, um, I, I'll send out an email tonight asking for some volunteers to go and assess, um, you know, what it looks like at the at the town uh, commons, and, and then um, we can come up with a list of suggestions, and then uh, we can forward that to Parks and Rec and the town board. Um, yes. a list of suggestions. Yeah. And let's, let's do it soon. Um, you know, maybe early evening, um, when you can join us, Jeff and, um, shoot, what was I going to say? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> long I mentally... <laughs> it's all outside. So it's all, it's all fun, but we'll, um, we, uh, Tom, we'll get, we'll get on that and oh. we'll, Sure you get a, a list. I know what I wanted. Is there some way we can see the original plans? Yeah. Tom um, Degatti, did you? I believe Judy has them. I think uh, Sam was involved okay. in the plans. So I can I can talk to her oh. and we can make sure we can get those sent. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Sounds good. Anything else? Uh, we're up to the town board report. Anything I think else? we've covered just about everything. One big thing that probably everyone's heard of, but just so you know, uh, there is some serious um, interest in the Fantasy Island Park reopening it. Um, there's, I don't know exactly where they're at at this point, but there's been some legal action that's been taken in terms of memos of understandings and some financial things, et cetera. It's been to the point where it was actually, there was an interview done on the news last week for anyone that saw it. So, I mean, the, the group that's looking at it is very serious um, and it does look pretty optimistic that there's a good possibility they may close on it and we may have a park next year. They wouldn't open it this year, but 2021 is what, what I'm hearing is what their plans are. Okay. Similar so that's some good news. Similar use like park. Right. Yep, they have a Ferris wheel, not the same one. They have lots of different, they have, they're a company that already has some rides in their inventory. So very interesting. Okay. Are they going to want yeah. the Sleeping Giant back? <laughs> I don't know. West River. I heard it's been, uh, sequestered somewhere. So it's quarantined in someone's yard, I heard. <laughs> it is. <laughs> All right, uh, any additional news or announcements? Just potential uh, consideration is that the uh, New York State Parks put out a uh, landscape plan for the West River Parkway. And oh. I think they're seeking comment. And I don't know if we want to comment on that at all or not. Take a look at it. And then the second thing is, this is for the future. The town planning board has a list 
of you know like questions and items or requirements for a, a project or you know uh, uh, projects i think that we should just scan the the town code for environmental requirements and then put it in the same format as the towning town planning board and then uh, circulate that for for comment in the CAB. I'd be willing to put a, a list together if somebody can scan the town code, but this is for the future. That's a that's a good suggestion. Just put it in the notes so we don't lose it. Maybe. I got you, Jim. Awesome. All I right. have a housekeeping question. Mm -hmm. You know, considering I'm new to the board, um, if you could just help me understand how how the the CAB approaches development on Grand Island, and what I mean specifically is, do do you have a piecemeal approach where you um, you address development per project, or and or is there um, a more holistic approach? Let's say, you know, um, a big picture. Uh, full town ecology um, approach to to development. Um, so, you know, I mean, I guess I could ans ask the question and then if someone wants to, I mean, if it could be answered quickly here, fine. I don't want to take up any more of anyone's time. Um, if it would be a longer answer, then you can then you can write to me or explain to me. But my question is, um, is there some sort of a database standard that has been or could be identified for the purpose of determining the impact of uh, development on the viability of the town's ecosystem. I mean, and, and the reason I'm asking this is because of this project, the Project Olive, Olive Project. Um, it's it's it seems to be you know potentially largely impactful. It's a lot of land, and um, so I guess I'm just wondering if there is such a thing as um, kind of like a, a, a standard, a big picture standard. So for example, how many acres of forest an island um, town of our size needs to properly support the environment's equilibrium, that kind of a thing. Is there is there a reference point? Um, do we know how many acres of forest we can afford to lose on the whole in what period of time before, um, before a standards-based unhealthy imbalance is, is threatening, that kind of a thing. Um, how well, does that work? I would mention the open space, Jeff, but I'll let you field the question. Um, yes, so as you know, as it pertains to Project Olive, um, a lot, the, the, this is kind of a loaded question, but I'll, I'll give you just the brief version. Uh, there, are, there are zoning standards and they're asking for um, uh, a new uh, d type of uh, zoning uh, a development district where basically all the rules go out the window, it's whatever they decide and then whatever the town board approves. Um, there really is, there is a landscape code that's written in the, into the um, uh, town code, but there's nothing, mm -hmm. you know, there, there, there's no definitive uh, law or number of, of uh, ecosystem loss that's acceptable. Um, that I that I've seen anyway. Uh, Mike, do you have anything to add? A couple of things I would just add. In theory, the long range plan in the zoning plan that's overlays that ultimately over the many decades that they have been doing this mm -hmm. um, should have taken some of your considerations, maybe not as clearly as what you just described, um, Liz, but uh, that is kind of a background consideration. I think um, I, I think we probably often think that it's pretty strongly pro-development um, and maybe more contribution from the Conservation Advisory Board is needed in some of those decisions. Hopefully we do better at that in the future. One of the things we've just done, completed recently is a uh, open space inventory and it actually ranks the different properties on the island, um, one through 10, if I remember correctly, but based on you know mature growth hardwoods, meadows, uh, wetlands, DC, New York wetlands, federal wetlands, uh, things of that nature. And uh, so now we have a better rating, like 
we know that the, the property where the uh, TC Buffalo, the Amazon project is, um, wasn't rated as high as over at the South Point project. That's one of the top properties, top 10 properties on the island, and, and which is no surprise. If you look at it, you can see there's mature hardwoods, there's wetlands, it's just teeming with wildlife, there's beaver, there's everything in that particular piece of land. But we do have at least, now we have an inventory of the properties on the island, we have a ranking of them based on um, the, the nature of the, the property. Um, but now that needs to be used as part of the planning process for long-term zoning and other decisions on the island and construction and things of that nature. Okay, thank you. Um, I, and and I, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> I was just going to say I can make I can share those documents with you with the open space inventory. It was created on criteria created by the Conservation Advisory Board that that looks at some of the more sensitive uh, ecologically sensitive areas on the island. And so it's a good document, especially when you're looking for areas to protect. Um, you know what are the most sensitive ones versus uh, the not so sensitive ones, um, and hopefully um, uh, in the future. Uh, once this document gets looked at, it will carry a little more weight um, and in the development of the island. Does it, does it make sense though that, that especially, I guess what I'm saying is especially for the unique um, geographical um, area that, the, that an island is bordered by water, um, does it make sense that that Grand Island that our town should have some um, data-based um, limits, essentially, um, on, on the amount of, not, not just, you know, per project, but, but overall, um, you know, like this project here, they, they did list a large population of white-tailed deer. And I know that that is related to the conversation that was had about the corridor um, with, with Buckhorn and how important that is. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is if, if there is some sort of a way, if it doesn't exist now outside of what you've just described, that um, the whole big picture of, of the town and the forest, et cetera, um, when we're talking about development, that that is taken into account because there's only so many places where deer, for example, or these other woodland creatures can go in Grand Island before they become a nuisance or they become threatened um, in terms of traffic and all of that sort of thing. Um, so specifically to Grand Island, you know. Well, um, I was just going to make a suggestion because what the subject you just brought up is a very important subject and maybe it should be on the agenda for the next meeting or something. Okay. So we can, we can devote the time it needs to, to deal with it. Well, and I'd like, I'm sorry, Sam, are you done? Yes. Well, I'd like to add to, it's, it's a very good question, Liz, that you're asking. One thing, when we completed our open space inventory, which isn't that long ago, our next step should be eventually to come up with an open space plan so that we can identify areas that we don't want to ever see disturbed, you know, that's the next step after the inventory is to actually do a plan. Uh, we haven't had time to start on that because of everything else that we've had to deal with. Um, and there are also a few guidelines in the comprehensive plan, but yeah, as a, as a board, we need, we need to seriously look at that. It's just, we, <laughs> we get all these projects that come up and it kind of, we have to put some things on the back burner, which we will, which we should address soon. So thank you for your thoughtful, uh, very thoughtful questions. It, it is something that we are aware of. And, and that, as the CAB has become more involved in um, uh, the development of the island, you know, kind of sort through things. This is a, uh, we're coming up on two hours and 40 minutes. Um, and uh, when we met at town hall, this was pretty common um, for a length of time uh, for a few meetings. So um, we, we try to keep the uh, agendas down there, but th this is some stuff that, that definitely we will uh, take into consideration. 
I am going to entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> so really, Alice is exhausted. Alice, and then by the second. <laughs> second. I second, Diane. All right, and uh, I don't think we have to do a roll call. All in favor, aye. 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 Says aye. Okay, let's let Mike, Mike, can you shut down the YouTube? Recording's off and I am ending. 934, <laughs> by the way, Tom. Got it. <laughs> Didn't the last oh. time at this time. Hold on one second. Thanks, Thanks Mike, for handling thank all you, the Mike. Zoom. Yeah, thank you You're for welcome. taking care of that.